the next presentation is by dr madhukar shahi madhukar yeah uh, management of thrombus in ami does anything work good morning ladies and gentlemen it's a pleasure to be here in hyderabad and i would like to thank uh, dr srinivas kumar for inviting me for this important meeting uh, the topic that i am going to talk on is management of thrombus in acute myocardial infarction during pci do we have anything up our sleeves now to make it disappear go away or treat it the way we want to we all know that with acute myocardial infarction the pathophysiology is a ruptured plaque with an occlusive thrombus this obviously is present in almost 100% of cases to start with but most studies show that it's the angiographic evidence of thrombus is present in 70% of cases by the time we do an angiogram and obviously it means that there is a certain amount of spontaneous lysis of thrombus and by the time we do the angiogram the numbers the percentage of patients that we see with thrombus is much less is there a grading for thrombus obviously there is a grading for thrombus and we find that there are grades which are G 0 1 and 2 which are minor thrombus and most of the time when you do a primary pci these things do not really matter so much it's the higher grades of thrombus that we are really worried about and especially in those cases which have a massive thrombus a large thrombus burden is basically defined as the presence of a thrombus in the vessel with the largest dimension of the thrombus more than 2 vessel diameters and a massive thrombus is usually more than 4 vessel diameters and these are the you know the kind of cases that have we have difficulty in when we are doing a primary pci for an acute myocardial infarction so why is the thrombus in acute myocardial infarction so important there are two major issues one is of course we all the, the interventionist nightmare having no reflow or slow flow due to distal embolization and worse early and late outcomes because we know that having an epicardial flow is not enough and there should be sufficient myocardial blood flow also to improve the outcomes because it causes large infarcts and it causes stent thrombosis because are concerned that the stent when we implant in cases which have thrombus the stent may not oppose the, uh, the the vessel walls well and as the thrombus gets dissolved there will there will be a late malposition and increased stent thrombosis so the final blush it's just not important to have you know a timi 3 flow in the epicardial vessel it's very very important to have a myocardial blood flow and this graphic actually shows you that that the mortality actually is increased as the myocardial blood flow goes down and so you have an open artery but you have a dead myocardium something has happened to this okay this is an example of a case which has a thrombus and you can see thrombus in the circumflex vessel you can see balloon being done to open it up there is large amount of thrombus balloon again extensive amount of thrombus here the operator decide to stent it now so that's one stent more thrombus proximally that's the second stent and that's what happens after you put in the second stent the thrombus is embolized gone distally and you actually get no reflow i just want to, yeah and you can actually see the thrombus gone distally this was cert subsequently retrieved using an export catheter so angiographic stent thrombus this study clearly showed that the large thrombus burden is an independent predictor of you know major adverse cardiac events and in fact relate artery stent thrombosis in patients treated with des for stemi so the idea is to reduce the thrombus burden either by dissolving the thrombus by extracting the thrombus and to certainly prevent if you can't dissolve or extract it then you must prevent distal th thrombus embolization what are the clinical situations in which you expect a high thrombus load and the interventionist should go with the idea that you he's going to face a thrombus burden one is late presentation failed thrombolysis coronary ectasia if the other arteries are ectatic if the proximal vessel is ectatic you think that there is a lot of ectasia likely to have a high thrombus burden vein grafts and patients who suffer from reinfarction uh whether the thrombus is going to respond to the kind of therapy that you're going to do it depends on the age of the thrombus the vessel and what kind of device what kind of uh, approach that you're going to use it depends on the vessel anatomy the tortuosity calcification if there's a tight lesion of the thrombus distally small caliber vessel what is the site of the lesion whether it's proximal distal osteal or not and what kind of guiding catheter support that you will require the management strategies against coronary thrombus basically consist of pharmacological approaches to dissolve the thrombus and mechanical approaches either manual 
or, or mechanical. And I'll just show you a few examples of this gentleman had an angiogram at one of, the, one of our satellite centers. The, the operator there found thrombus in both, the massive thrombus in both the right and the left coronary arteries. He did not have any kind of a device to remove the thrombus, and so he asked us what to do. We said, why don't you give him intravenous RioPro, that's abseximab, and transfer him to the cath lab. Two hours later, when we took him into the cath lab, he had absolutely clean arteries. This gentleman is a 25-year-old boy with an acute inferior wall myocardial infarction with large thrombus burden in the right, right coronary artery. We wired it, did thrombus suction, and you find that actually during the process we embolized some thrombus distally. This is after thrombus suction. We could not get any decent amount of removal of thrombus, so we gave him boluses, T and K, 5 milligrams every 5 minutes to a total of 20 milligrams, waited 20 minutes, and this was the result. So we could get away without putting a stent in this young man. What are the mechanical approaches to a thrombus? Obviously, you try to aspirate it, which is the easiest and the most popular, and the most popular is the export or the pronto catheters. Other is using angiojet or exciser mechanical thrombectomy and using distal protection. Let us look at the, the t kind of trials which have occurred with, with both the mechanical and the manual uh, you know, th thrombectomy devices. If you look at all the trials, let's look at the non-manual thrombectomy and we find using Angiojet, Exciser, Rescue and TVAC and what you basically found is that most of the manual, uh, the, the, the mechanical thrombectomy devices were not better than standard PCI. And in fact, the studies clearly showed that simple devices like the export were much better than using a mechanical device. Non-manual thrombectomy trial, the cumulative survival was the same. With manual aspiration, the survival was a little better. And this was, so this is the most common device used to remove thrombus. If you look at this case, again, there's thrombus in the LED. Wired down, some thrombosuction done, flow is much better. Again, you get much better flow and much less thrombus burden. And then you stent it directly without predilatation, and you have a decent result. So thrombus aspiration and direct stenting in primary PCFI stomach, everybody knows the TAPAS trial. This trial was a single center trial, and it did show that it is applicable in a large majority of patients and results in better reperfusion than conventional PCI. Also, the 30-day and one-year event rates and mortality was much lower if you use thrombus aspiration. However, the current infused AMI trial, which is presented this year, randomized patients to manual aspiration versus no aspiration, and then gave intracoronary abseximab versus no abseximab. The unique aspects of this trial was that they used intracoronary abseximab using a clearway catheter which actually infuses slowly, exudes RioPro into the thrombus. And then they try to look at the results. And this is the clearway catheter, which is a microporous PTFA balloon, which is mounted on a 2.7 French RX catheter. The fluid weeps through the balloon, does not cause intimal injury, and, you use, and, and it was, this was compared versus using the export catheter. What are the results? When you look at the entire study, using the intracoronary abseximab versus no abseximab, you found that the infarct size of 30 days, as judged by cardiac MRI, was actually significantly less with the infusion of local infusion, intracoronary infusion of RioPro. What about aspiration versus no aspiration? When you look at that, you found that there was not much difference. The conclusion of this trial was that bolus IC abseximab delivered to the infarct lesion site via the clearway RX infusion catheter resulted in a modest reduction in infarct size, which is significant. However, this did not occur with manual aspiration. I don't think the, the last word has been said on this, and when we treat all comers with acute myocardial infarction with these kind of devices, it is important for us to understand that every patient is not the same. And therefore, none of these trials really graded the thrombus and then you know, subdivided these, the number of patients who had uh, ma massive thrombus or large thrombus and treat them and then saw the difference. So when you treat all comers, then you have a lo lot of patients who when you put in a wire, you just find a small amount of thrombus, and these patients are not going to be benefited by using export or anything else. So what are the issues with thrombectomy? The amount of aspirate thrombotic material is usually small. 
that was almost less than 0.5 millimeters seen in the TAPAS trial. 33% of STEMI patients present with a large thrombus burden, making aspiration process extremely challenging. And adequate aspiration is possible only in approximately 60% of cases. So the idea is, can we leave thrombus behind? And the second is the problem of sizing, and this is important when you deal with patients who have STEMI, because you're worried about malapposition and underexpansion. You don't want to, ex you know, high pressure dilate stents when you're doing an acute MI with large thrombus burden, because the fear that thrombus maceration will, will, you know, cause embolization and slow flow and no reflow. And so there is always a question of undersizing the stent when you have a patient with a large thrombus burden. This clearly shows that in a thrombotic lesion, when you have early stent malposition and there is very late and late stent thrombosis because usually the stent is undersized. So this, is, this, has, this stent is a newer stent which has not been really used, uh, um, you know, uh, in, in uh, out of clinical uh, trials. But this is called, this nitinol stent, which is a self-expanding stent. And the idea here is that you basically implant this self-expanding stent in a thrombus-containing lesion, and the stent kind of gradually expands as thrombus dissolves. It also prevents distal embolization because it tends to, you don't tend to use higher pressures in this kind of a stent, and so you don't tend to cause distal embolization. And this is an example where export is used. You have a substantial amount of thrombus still left in the right coronary artery, and this is the stent is stent, and this is the result. Obviously, the stent, uh, the, the results of this, you know, six-month data was presented, at 30, sorry, 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 the 30-day data was presented at, this, at the Europe PCR this time, called A position 3, and here it seems to be that at 30 days the stent was safe and effective, and the rates of adverse events was comparable to uh, the other stents, in fact, less. The other important advances in treating uh, or preventing no reflow in stent, uh, thrombus containing lesions, the MGARD prime stent. This stent is again a chromium cobalt stent, which has a sleeve which is of knitted Dacron. And this kind of traps the thrombus, uh, you know, uh, to the vessel wall and prevents distal embolization. This is clearly shown that when you do aspiration, there is, you know, an OCT, you have a residual thrombus left. And so when you put this stent, you find the edges of the mesh and you find that the stent, the, the stent actually, you know, uh, the, the, the thrombus trapped between the mesh, behind the mesh and the vessel wall. This example of an acute MI, which is uh, being treated with an MGARD stent, you, you, have, you use the expir, uh, you know, export catheter first, and then we thought that it may be better for us to just use the MGARD stent in this case and see how it functions. This is the MGARD stent. And this is the final result. This is a rather difficult case of the right coronary artery, ectatic, proximally, a lot of thrombus. Wire down, you, s you see the amount of atherosclerotic plaque and thrombus in this vessel. Uh, can you please uh, finish your lecture because your time is up, please? Yeah. So here we use one M guard stent. We don't normally use two M guard stents because overlapping them may be a problem. And this is the kind of result that you get. So M guard stent master trial, which was the results of use of M guard in acute myocardial infarction. My conclusions are that reducing thrombus burden during PCI and AMI improves outcomes. Liberal use of GP2B3 inhibitor, especially intracoronary and manual aspiration, is, is recommended in most cases. Those with large vessels and a large thrombus load may require more complex procedures, including rheolytic thrombectomy, intracoronary lytics, with, distal, with or without distal protection. Newer stent systems such as MGARD and Stentis appear to hold promise in improving outcomes in this extremely difficult patient subset. Thank you for your kind attention.